Okay, so let's go to let's go to Frank Milburn, sir. Frank, you with us? He, he is with us. He's muted out. Let's. I am here now. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. You look wonderful. Great. Okay. Well, I just say um, thanks very much for the invite, Tim. It's nice to be back. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to just go through this presentation. If everybody could hold any questions they've got to the end. It should be fairly self-explanatory. Um, if anybody wants me to go back over any of it, I can do that. But um, yeah, okay, so here we go. So Tim's very kindly invited me to ask about the uh, July 2019 uh, Catalina sightings. So I said, yeah, I'll take that on. Um, so I just want to do a kind of like a proviso at the beginning or a disclaimer. <laughs> okay, so it's not a forensic investigation. Um, I am a contributing member at, the, at SCU, the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies. Uh, but this isn't a, like an investigation, you know, like they did on the Aguadilla, Puerto Rico, um, UAP, USO, or in the Nimitz case, because they did two, you know, big chunky reports on both of those. And so I don't have the, all the answers. Um, what I'm really looking here to do is, you know, to keep an open mind. And, um, you know, really what I want to see, what I've learned from doing this presentation is that I really, you know, need to see a lot more data. There's a lot of theory and supposition out there, so I'll present facts when they're facts and theories and supposition will be presented as such, okay? And then, you know, everybody can decide for themselves uh, what they think is the most likely theory that fits. Okay, so to give a brief overview, is the sound okay for everybody? Okay, cool. So in July 2019, um, there was, you know, basically a flotilla of U.S. naval vessels which encountered uh, what were put in deck logs, deck logs as uh, uh, drones or UAVs. So these were multiple craft sightings, uh, July 14, 15, and then later on again, 25 and 30 of July. Uh, these craft were operating at night uh, in low visibility and over, above, and around, and in the general vicinity of the vessels. Um, they were operating for long kind of duration periods, uh, over 90 minutes in some cases, and the maneuvers were described as, as brazen. Okay, so the ships involved, there were uh, five Arleigh Burke class destroyers. And there was also a case with another vessel, which is a, an independence class littoral combat ship, which... Uh, whose logs actually put it in the in the same vicinity during some of the sightings and had its own uh, has some own uh, imagery associated with it, which I'll cover later on. OK, so the sightings saw deployment of uh, imagery intelligence or Snoopy teams, which is basically guys with cameras um, who aid in the tactical evaluation of uh, threats to the vessel. So they come out with, uh, you know, like NVGs, you know, night vision and uh, and commercial cameras and they take additional imagery. And this later prompted investigation, uh, which included the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. Okay, so they do criminal investigations. They also do um, uh, counterintelligence. And then the Office of Naval Intelligence got involved. And later, as we'll see in the presentation, the, um, the UAP task force. Okay, and I've written a separate paper on the UAP task force, if anybody's interested. The Coast Guard and the FBI also got involved. And it later, this came to the attention of the Chief of Naval Operations, who is, uh, you know, the, the senior uniformed officer in the Navy and the member of the Joint Chiefs. So there's been some very good articles written about it and some not good, uh, so good articles about it. Um, the uh, initial article was prompted, um, was this uh, war zone article, multiple destroyers swarmed by mysterious drones off California numerous nights. Um, then there's some other, there's another very good soft rep article about it, which uh, gives some different theories to the other article. Um, here's the one about the CNO getting involved and his comments. Okay. And then what was problematic is later on, um, you had this sort of like this cut and paste journalism. So on the one hand, yeah, it's great that, uh, you know, the telegraph in the UK is, is following up on this report. What's not so good is they're just cutting and pasting what somebody else has said and they haven't actually done any research and they look pretty stupid. <laughs> okay. Um, so the information requirements really looking at this case uh, are, you know, what are the craft, um, what are the technologies behind them, uh, who's responsible for them, you know, who's, who's in charge, and what are the intentions. So I and others, and I, and I will, you know, discuss who I've been talking to about this as well. So we looked at different things, it's some kind of like advanced, uh, you know, unmanned aerial vehicle, um, 
are these like you know sub launched air launched uh, where they launch from um you know terra firma so whose are they is this us navy is it air force is it adversary is it com is it uh, commercial or is it criminal and criminal in this case i mean you know like you know somebody with a with a commercial drone who, who wants to harass uh, you know like aircraft or, or vessels okay so what are the intentions are we talking uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance and protect, potentially target acquisition as well is it harassment is it a prank um, is it a military exercise you know uh, or, or some kind of test and you know i've discussed these with various people are we looking at um, human and sensor spoofing technology and there's been a lot of uh, a lot about you know written about this recently and this has been going back decades as well you know electronic warfare projects blue beam nemesis uh, palladium which are all um uh you know use different methods whether it's holograms drones um balloons to basically spoof sensors and also to, 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 to spoof humans sensors so is it one of those sort of more prosaic uh, explanations, or is it something more exotic, as in, you know, UAP, unexplained aerial phenomena, not from here? So, again, proviso, it's hard to be sort of 100% of any theory, really, without access to the video, and also as will become, um, you know, more pertinent as well in the presentation, uh, you know, the eyewitness testimony, and also uh, establishing the provenance of the, um, you know, the, sen the, the film Im imagery, and also getting hold of sensor data, right, if that were available, you know, sort of like a, you know, infrared, um, uh, radar, you know, sonar potentially, okay, the thing, kind of things that the Navy aren't going to give away, but those would all be very, very useful and would provide an understanding. Um, it's useful to go over the area of operations, okay? So this is the South California uh, offshore complex down here. Okay, so it's a very large area of, of space, water, and subsurface area. It's a it's a major range complex in, in a in a series of other complexes which uh, you know serve the Pacific Fleet. Okay, this is uh, up here. You got LA. Okay, so you got um, Santa Catalina Island, and you have got San Clemente Island, and this is the Gulf of Santa uh, Catalina. So these are two sort of dominant features offshore. These two islands. Uh, this island is a big range complex, as I'll come to. Okay, you've got St. Nicholas Island up here. And the sightings take place both inside the Gulf and outside the Gulf. So really, it's to the, the landward and the seaward side of the islands. Okay, but this is, uh, as I will go into more detail, it's a very, very, uh, you know, the water gets deep here very, very quickly. Okay, so if we're looking at an air chart of the area, we see immediately um, it's a pretty busy area. Uh, this is the U.S. Air Defense Identification Zone. So most of the sightings uh, occurred uh, well inside the U.S. Air Defense Identification Zone. Okay, and you can see around here because it's a range area. This whole island is like one air range area. So you've got various warnings, and you know the vessels are operating like in the vicinity of this island. Okay, some of the range areas. There's a, uh, there's a lot of them. So I've highlighted some of the um, you know more interesting ones. So. The Navy and others, they can, you know, do everything from, you know, anti-submarine warfare training, um, uh, electronic warfare, uh, testing areas, you know, mine testing areas, amphibious warfare. Okay, you get the idea. Um, it basically serves uh, Marines as well and also naval special warfare. Um, and also as well, you know, the obviously the airborne elements of the Navy. Okay, San Clemente Island, which is the southern island that we talked about. Um, it's one big range area and it's very sophisticated. Okay. You've got an area where it can basically launch, um, simulated missile launches of SAMs called Smoky SAMs. Uh, it's also got like an artillery bombardment area and it's got a, uh, special warfare training area here. Um, this map up here. Okay. There's the Island, like in miniature, but this just shows like there's a huge electronic warfare range off the South of the Island. Okay. And then to the the west of it, you've got uh, an anti-submarine warfare range. But if you look in relation to the other islands, St. Nicholas Island and Santa Catalina Island, you can see that, you know, this is a huge offshore uh, series of ranges. Okay. And now I've marked down uh, some of the, um, the uh, types of exercise that they run on this island and air defense exercise or ADEX. Um, that's what uh, one of my sources believe that the, the, the five vessels were involved in doing because they're, they're Aegis uh, equipped. Okay, so I spoke to both Dave Beatty and Mark Chicotti. Oh, let me go back. 
uh, Mark Giacotti was one of the authors of the uh, Warzone article. Uh, Dave Beatty is a filmmaker and journalist. Um, he came up with the, the great animated film about the Nimitz account, uh, encounters and also interviewed a lot of the key witnesses like Kevin Day. Okay, so Mark Chakotty and his partner in the, in the exercise for the article, so they, they went ahead and fought, foiled the deck logs um, after Dave Beatty had originally um, got hold of the USS Kid logs because that was, the I think, the first one that was involved in incidents. And also Dave Beatty through a third party, he got uh, in contact with some witnesses um, from the, uh, some of the vessels, which I'll talk about in a bit. Okay, so emails got foiled as well. Um, and also the uh, Mark Giacotti and his partner, they got hold of ship tracking data. They reconstructed the positions of both US naval vessels and commercial vessels. And they also put together um, you know, from that the, the drone sightings and movements for their report. Okay, these were some of the um, messages that, uh, that Dave Beatty was getting from, um, you know, people who'd been on the vessels. So they're basically uh, saying, well, some of them thought they were drones, some of them thought they were Chinese, some of them talking about the lights uh, that were seen. But I think the basic, the important thing about this is to take away that uh, there really needs to be uh, witnesses who actually go on the record because this is just basically you know screenshots of people's mobile phones yeah so the importance of having eyewitness testimony to sort of nail down exactly what happened in these cases okay so if we have a quick look at the platforms that are involved as well um these are the uh ollie burke class destroyers okay so they're absolutely gleaming um full of sensors um and all kinds of like electronic warfare kit and decoys. Okay, extremely well armed as well. Uh, in the context of like small aircraft, um, missiles, um, and um, you know, drones, for example, operating uh, in close proximity to the vessels. Okay, so you've got the you know, Phalanx Sea Whiz, um, Bushmaster Cannon, 50 Cals, and my personal favorite, the M240, which is a 762 belt fed. Um, and all of those uh, would be good for blasting drones out the sky. And, and we'll talk about a little bit more about this later. Uh, they do also carry aircraft as well. Um, so that should be noted really in the context that um, if they were drones, then they could be construed as being not only a threat to navigation, but also a threat to air safety as well, if, uh, if they were aircraft operating. Okay, this is night one of the incident. And I lifted... Um, I lifted uh, this map from the Warzone article. So what's interesting is they have these sightings, so they immediately deploy uh, their ship nautical or otherwise photographic interpretation and exploitation team, which is a Snoopy team. Okay, then they go to River City 1, which is uh, emissions control, which is where they basically shut off their... Um, broadcasting their ship's permission uh, a position and they shut down all uh, you know electric electromagnetic emissions okay basically to make that they go dark um the interesting thing here is uh there are sort of reported sightings between the ships uh, white lights uh, hovering over a flight deck for 90 minutes uh, one of the objects is moving at 16 knots and um, we're talking very low visibility one nautical mile okay uh, there's various commercial uh, vessels in, in the vicinity, but having the automatic identification system on isn't mandatory. So um, it's possible that there, are, there were other vessels in the vicinity that, 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 that wouldn't be picked up in that manner, although they would be populating, you know, surface search radars. So then according to Dave Beatty's source, the objects were not drones and the crew was freaking out. Okay, but this is again, um, underlines the need to have... Uh, uh, you know, witness witnesses going on the record and providing testimony to actually nail down uh, the the events. This is the night two um, of the incident in July. So, July fifteen. So again, Snoopy teams are deployed, um, and then on from the USS Russell. So you're talking about drones dropping in elevation, apparently moving forward, backwards, left and right. Okay. So then they contact a commercial vessel uh, or they get contacted by a commercial vessel that basically says the drone's not theirs. Okay, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And then the USS Peralta reports two and then four UAVs nearby. 
And this is a three hour event duration uh, craft unidentified. Okay, so this prompts investigation off the 15th. So you've got the Coast Guard, NCIS. Uh, they report to the command of the Pacific Fleet and also to, they, they send a report to Compact Fleet and also to the Chief of Naval Operations. So the initial focus of the investigation is on, you know, the possibility that it's commercial vessels and associated drones. Okay, but also but they, in the emails that were forwarded, um, the, the vessels when questioned, you know, they, they've got very limited capabilities for their drones. Okay, and they were also you know, a, a fair distance from the U.S. Navy vessels. Then the Office of Naval Investigation gets involved, and then the UAP Task Force. Um, then drones are ruled out by the U.S. Navy. Um, but uh, the war zone for their article, they couldn't FOIA a classified, a classified briefing on uh, unmanned, unidentified aerial systems um, from the Navy. Dave Beatty, when I spoke to him, he told me that he'd foiled uh, ONI for all Snoopy team reports from July, but he'd got a reply back saying that uh, they were classified. Okay. And so then just as his report is kind of like, you know, um, gathering steam, there's renewed uh, sightings July 25th and July the 30th from, from USS Kid. Okay. So then there's uh, that, that first article that I showed you one of the first articles I showed you, and it was talking about the chief of naval operations. So he's asked if the Navy have, you know, had pos positively identified any of the craft involved. So he's like, no, we have not. Um, these findings have been collected. They're still being analyzed. We do have a well-established process in place, blah, 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 to collect that data and to get it to a separate repository for, a repository for analysis. So that's the CNO, you know, the, the, the senior Navy guy. Okay, so some of the observations that came out of that, and, and, uh, and I'll say, tell you what the war zone guys said and what I think. Okay, so the war zone guys are saying commercial drones, not capable of, uh, of generally of flying, you know, such long durations, uh, flying in speeds of excess of uh, 45 miles per hour. Um, and then they actually estimate in one case that drones traversed at least 100 nautical miles on July 14th incident. So then they also say it's difficult to catch a destroyer traveling at 16 knots and less than one nautical mile visibility, at least five to six drones coordinated simultaneously. Okay, so there's a control issue there. So I ask, well, is it a question of line of sight control or is it satellite? Is it uh, pre-programmed? Is there some kind of drone that's acting as part of a swarm node, okay, to enable the other drones to operate? Um, where are the drones launched from? And there's a possibility, okay, was there some kind of testing going on on San Clemente Island? And it's noted then in the article as well, you know, there were strange events in the area previously, you know, the 2004 Nimitz encounters, okay, when you're talking about UAP. But um, let's still go with the more prosaic explanations. So if they were drones, where did they land or did they ditch? Was it some kind of like expendable drone? Was it sub-launched, air-launched? Was it a, a launch clandestinely from a vessel, perhaps a fishing vessel or a small commercial vessel? Um, how was the drone, how were the drones not detected earlier? Um, or, you know, do we know that they were not detected earlier? And also, uh, you know, how was the launch platform not detected? And the other question is, you know, the power for the drone lights, because the, 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 there are a lot of lights seen in association with the drones. So that would be a, you know, uh, you know, power source that they'd require, as well as for general endurance. Okay, so in the war zone, they say, yeah, Navy's got a lot of um, data. And then they say there's, you know, they talk about the sophisticated surveillance capabilities, the advanced sensors, um, including the land-based sensors as well. Um, and then they say, well, this might call into question the drone designation, you know. And I talked to Kevin Day about this. And he is a radar and air defense expert. He's one of the key witnesses from the 2004 uh, Nimitz investigation, and he spent like you know 18 years in these in these very waters uh, throughout his career, um, and he's also now uh, you know still sailing those waters. So we talked about uh, underwater sensors, land-based radar, satellite coverage, um, and he basically told me that it would be very very difficult for submarines, despite the depth, it'd be very very difficult for submarines or surf surface vessels or aircraft to operate you know with impunity in that area of operations uh, and ostensibly for all intents and purposes, you know, the U S Navy owns those waters. Okay. So then there was another um, war zone article 
And the basic the premise of this one, adversary drones are spying on the US and the Pentagon acts like they're UFOs. Okay, and, and I've seen Tim and others debating this recently on email. Okay, so the the basic the premise of this article, swarms of drones harassed a number of US Navy destroyers. That swarm could have been and likely was sucking up or helping another nearby platform suck up all that sensitive ELINT, that's electronic intelligence data, or the most capable warships on Earth at very close range. So this article's coming down on theory. Yeah, they're drones, uh, adversarial tech. And then, yeah, the drone swarm could have come from a simple cargo vessel, wouldn't have had to even been within line of sight. Um, talks about how the destroyers themselves could have been tracked. And then going back to the drones, uh, they can fly for hours, could easily be programmed to execute a certain route in the vicinity of where the vessels were, were going to be. And that's, so this is the interesting bit, even potentially programmed to react to certain radio frequency emissions. Okay. So China in particular already has the operational capability uh, to deploy large network swarms. Russia has focused on drone swarms that are you know, EW uh, enabled. Okay, then there's another article which is very interesting, and I put a link because it's well worth reading. And this is by um, an ex-US Navy uh, aircrew guy, and he's also an ASW uh, specialist. So he talks about the, um, the the premise of his article was that the US Navy knows a lot more than it, than it's saying, and okay, that probably goes without saying. So he's saying uh, emissions control reduces emi emission signature, um, going quiet makes the ship's electronic surveillance systems work much better. Um, so that the ships themselves would be hoovering up, um, you know, all the kinds of emissions um, associated with the drones, as well as taking imagery of them. Yeah, and he underlines the point that the destroyers are, you know, their, um, you know, intelligence gathering platforms as much as they are warships. My um, notes on this would be going quiet. It also reduces the possibility for target acquisition because if we imagine the drones were operating in um in several uh, possible like you know mission modes intelligence surveillance target acquisition and reconnaissance if you have been pinged by a drone certainly if you were in wartime okay you'd go dark because the next thing you'd be expecting um might may, might it be a suicide drone might it be controlling or uh, activating suicide drones or uh you know are you going to be receiving um a visit by anti-ship missiles or aircraft and or aircraft or submarines so that's another reason why you go dark Okay. Um, and he like, says, you know, drone technology, not very complicated. It would be possible to deduce, you know, for the US Navy to deduce a lot of information about them. Okay. Then he talks about their controllers. So that indicates to me he's coming firmly down the side that, yeah, they are, you know, basically terrestrial control. It's terrestrial tech um, and it's adversarial. And the fact that they were operating at night and in low vis was basically to make intelligence, their intelligence gathering operations um, harder to detect. And that makes sense. Okay, so why weren't the drones shot down? So the soft rep guy, and he's ex-Navy, right? So he's saying the drones weren't really endangering the ships. They're outside territorial waters, not committing an act of war, but they were within uh, the American Air Defense Identification Zone. Okay, my notes on that. Uh, if you look at like uh, what happened to the USS Cole, okay, that wasn't a drone. It was a small boat. The Houthis uh, in Yemen, their use of drones, both aerial drones to attack targets and also uh, drone boats to attack vessels. Um, Islamic State has successfully used drones uh, to drop um, uh, munitions on targets and to hit targets. Okay. And uh, the Is Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as well in the Gulf, you know, they've got like, you know, thousands and thousands of drones. So the US Navy would be concerned about it for all those reasons. Um, Kevin Day underlined this as well when I talked to him, and he said, going back to the 2004 Nimitz incidents, when he saw these objects dropping from high altitude to just above the surface of the ocean, he said the officer in the CIC wasn't that interested, but basically he forced the guy to act by saying that it was an air safety issue. So as soon as he said it was a safety issue, the guy had to act. Okay, so then the soft rep guys, other point, imagery of Jones and, uh, and capturing their electronic emissions and intel gathering opportunity. And I'm like, well, yeah, but not at the expense of, you know, vulnerability to, to drone attack or, or other missions. So you wouldn't want to be putting your ships in danger. I mean, if you're the, 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 if you're the, the captain of a vessel, you're going to be extremely concerned by any uh, unidentified objects which are flying in the vicinity uh, or, and around and on the decks of your vessels. You're going to be extremely concerned about that. 
So then his, his other point is shooting down Mr. Jones would provide a propaganda coup. coup. And I, my reply to that would be, well, it's much better than losing personnel and assets and looking incompetent. Because if you had, say, a swarm of drones, and, and, and in these reports, there are up to six drones at a time, you don't have to, you, you don't have to physically worry about destroying um, the, the destroyer. You can basically take out the radars. You can take out uh, you know, sensors. Okay, so you can take a ship out of commission. You don't have to destroy it. You can just basically, uh, you know, neuter it and and disable its ability to operate. So the question is then: so why there's no why is there no shoot down of drones and why is there no use of anti drone technology? So does this mean that that, it's, that there was something uh, other than drones involved? Okay, so. The soft rep Navy guy, his theory, US Navy vessels tracked by satellite, the drones most likely Chinese and directed by satellite, um, that the drones, uh, you know, could have been operating basically from, um, you know, sort of like uh, marine militia warships. Uh, another theory is that they could have been operating from fishing boats. Um, and they would have turned off their their automatic information system broadcasting their position uh, to get to get closer to where they wanted to be. So he says, yeah, if the transceivers are turned off, they'd easily be dismissed as uh, commercial tuna or shrimping boats. Um, my suggestion for this would be if the Chinese were going to do that and be and they had the ability to surprise like US a flotilla of US, US Navy vessels at sea, they'd really want to be holding that as a trump card for a scenario of a transition to war, uh, where potentially, you know, in a situation, for example, where they were going to attack Taiwan, then they'd want to take out American assets, which are at the other side of the Pacific before they could get into the uh, Taiwan theater of operations. So I think this is a trick that the Chinese want to keep up their sleeve. Um, rather than advertise their, their capacity to do that. But that's just uh, uh, my opinion there. Um, then the guy says, well, if you were China and you, were, you wanted to sell your dra drones, it would be very good marketing to be like buzzing American vessels and taking pictures of them. Yeah, but it would also be awful marketing um, if, you, if they get shot down <laughs> or captured, then you'd look stupid. Um, and he says the Navy would not want to inform an adversary that we know and how we know it. And I said, well, it's a moot point if your vessel gets attacked. You wouldn't want to have your vessel being attacked and you wouldn't want to have these things operating in, around and over your vessels. OK. OK, now we get to um, the imagery that uh, Jeremy Corbell um, has put out, has published, and has supposedly been leaked. Um, the... Pentagon spokesman has said, uh, I can confirm the reference photos and videos were taken by Navy personnel. However, she's refused to confirm whether they're unidentified or used as some kind of training material. Um, so this purports to see some kind of triangular shape uh, hovering 700 feet over, over a vessel. But uh, it's very hard to say exactly what it is from you know, a photo. It's not a lot to go on. Um, and as I've gone to describe, you really need to find out more about the provenance of, of this imagery. Okay, so Corp Bell says that uh, this is like multiple pyramid-shaped craft that were seen by USS Russell, and this comes from his website. Okay, then he actually goes on the news, uh, Fox News with Tucker Carlson, and you can see Dave Beatty here. He's pretty upset about it. He's like, um, who wrote that? Clearest evidence of nothing. Some person filming a helicopter drone or plane out of focus. Did anyone do one minute of analysis? Um, and then, you know, at the bottom, this is a very sad and low day in the history of this group. I hope things improve. Um, so there's been a lot of upset about this. I haven't got involved in any of it. I'm not an imagery analyst. I'll let other people figure it out. And then when more data comes out, I'll, uh, I'll go firm on that. Okay, so another Warzone article came out. Um, this comes down firmly on the side of the drone theory. They seem to show either delta wing-shaped drones, another type of drone that is obscured by bokeh effect. That's the, the focusing issues. Um, once again, nothing appears explainable here. Quite the opposite, really. Okay, but um, I've sp um, there's at least one uh, night vision expert um, who's not convinced by the bokeh theory. So the jury's out on that one. So there's a blog as well, which is quite interesting. 
so Corbella said that these, uh, this imagery and video came from uh, an Office of Naval Intelligence classified briefing, but whether it was given to him, you know, a leak, it, right? We don't know the proven provenance of it. So there's no more information about the vetting process. These are the key words here, uh, impressive provenance. That's what we really need for these images. And then he brings in this guy, Stephen Aftergood, uh, gives a quote and says, if someone can't reliably identify the source of that information because it's classified, then that would count against its credibility. And I'd have to agree. Can you guys just hold a sec? Just give me a break. My cat's going nuts outside the door. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, thanks guys. Sorry, he's driving me mad. Just meowing, meowing, meowing. Okay, so where are were we? Yeah, so we're talking about the provenance of uh, you know of, of, of the of this imagery and where it's come from. You know, what's the basically the trail of the the, the chain of evidence, the chain of custody. So now Corbell um, <laughs> goes on Fox again. Uh, this is probably the best UFO military film footage, certainly, that I've ever seen, but I also think that the world has ever seen, right? So that's a pretty big statement to make. Um, and I would argue greatest ever footage, no. Um, SCU actually did a, um, a report on three minutes of uh, UFO and USO footage from... Uh, Aguadilla in Puerto Rico. So there they knew what the platform was. It was a Customs and Border Patrol aircraft. That should be CBP. Yeah. Uh, they knew the location of the, uh, of, of, the, of the platform that was taking the imagery. They knew the meteorology. They knew the exact camera system that was used, which was military grade. Uh, they knew the chain of custody of the imagery that was taken by that system. Uh, they spent one and a half years of forensic investigation, over a thousand hours of analysis, going pixel by pixel. Um, to get three minutes of a UFO that becomes uh, a USO and then comes out of the water and becomes two UFOs, okay? So I'd argue if you wanted your greatest ever UFO footage, <laughs> you're going to be um, hard to trump that one, okay? That's obviously in the open source domain. Okay, Lou Elizondo, he's chimed in on this as well, on this case. So he's uh, sort of talked about sort of... Uh, sort of drone drone specific characteristics, rotary versus uh, fixed wing drones. But he said the US Navy had been using the term drones instead of U UAP precisely because they knew that uh, deck logs could be foiled. Okay, and they don't want to get into the whole like UFO UAP scenario. Um, he talks about the unique flight characteristics and, and erratic, um, you know, performance of these drones in these incidents. He says that the US Navy has anti drone tech. He says US, uh, uh, the US uh, would use deadly force to protect their vessels, i.e. as in shooting down the drones, not killing a human, but destroying the drones. So he said that the US Navy not doing anything is an indicator that it's uh, not conventional technology, that it's not drones. He says if it was Chinese, then the modus operandi would be very provocative, right? Swarming around uh, US Navy destroyers. So then his sort of Conclusion is very high probability, not Chinese. So I thought that was interesting. Although, bear in mind the proviso that he wasn't actually there. Um, but if you um, look at my latest paper, it actually uh, talks about uh, his and Chris Mellon's relationship to the UAPTF. This is my last paper on, uh, on, the, on UAP. Um, it also talks about his agenda for a Manhattan-style project uh, to develop UAP. And also does a deeper dive on the technology from both uh, Elizondo and Dr. Jack Sarfati. Okay, so we talked at the beginning about spoofing tech. Um, and there were, the war zone has been putting out a lot of articles about this over the last kind of couple of years. Um, so there's various options, uh, sub air, land launched, um, drones that launch drones, uh, drones that are basically, uh, you know, sort of expendable just for like EW and spoofing. Okay. So this is one of them was his nemesis that shows like a whole kind of like internet system to basically like, you know, full, uh, you know, enemy, uh, enemy systems. I spoke to Kevin Day, 
um, who I said he's an expert, expert on the Spy One radar, anti-air warfare coordinator, he was a Top Gun air intercept controller, um, 18 years, as I said, in the US Navy service in those specific waters, uh, and he's logged hundreds of hours of air intercepts of a suspect aircraft uh, in training and, in opera and on operations. Okay, so this is what he had to say. Um, an undisclosed text laid over an operational exercise would break every single safety rule in the books. I wrote naval exercise scenarios for a living for a great many years, and that was never done ever. And so if it was a test on ourselves, then I'd be very, very shocked and concerned too. Okay. So then we, we were discussing, we asked the question, well, why would the Naval Criminal, Investigates, uh, in, uh, Naval Criminal Investigative Service and the Coast Guard and the Office of Naval Intelligence investigate if it were a US test, right? There wouldn't be a need to test. There wouldn't be a need to... Um, to investigate. So there's easier places to conduct uh, such a test, right? So you've got the South, Cal uh, South California offshore ranges, which I discussed at the beginning of the piece. So you've got EW, you've got radar, you've got uh, airfield available. Okay. You've got like, you know, really, really large ranges to do it in. Um, an adversary would be wary of compromising their technology, endangering US Navy crews, and also creating some kind of military, you know, political crisis, I think that close to America's shores. But, you know, then you have you know, the Americans getting buzzed when they're in the Baltic or when they're in, um, you know, sort of Chinese waters or Chinese claimed waters. Um, so, I, you know, I keep an open mind on that one. And then Kevin Day again says, you know, I believe this, you know, the spoofing is actually a possible explanation. And this is why I really like him because he keeps an open mind. Um, I simply do not have enough information to make that call yet. And my mind remains open. So, I mean, you know, that's really great. Um, so then he relates that to his own experiences in Nimitz. Um, so he said, you know, okay, the fact that, that we saw this on radar and then the other people, you know, saw the Tic Tac with their eyes, this would have to mean that the spoofing tech, tech was, uh, you know, incredible. Okay, so that's, you know, a very fair point from, a, from an expert. Okay, so then we had a, another ship involved. And according to the debrief um, media, this ship was also underway in the SoCal range area, July 9th to the 19th. Okay, that was when I, so that would put it in the time frame for the drone events or, or these um, unidentified craft events. Okay, so it's a literal, uh, independence class literal combat vessel. Okay, this is the imagery again from Corbell. So it says USS Omaha observed a possible UAS, spherical in shape, moving towards the surface of the water and then disappearing. Assess the object had sunk. And then from, uh, from Corbell's website, he basically says that it's a spherical craft and appeared to be a transmedium vehicle. As in, you know, can operate in air, can operate in water. Okay, the war zone again, um, they're talking about, you know, that, that event and that specific imagery shows what some claim is a transmedium craft disappearing into the ocean. The stills provided prove nothing of the sort. It looks like a balloon or other object hitting the water as seen through a thermal imaging system. Okay, so need to see the provenance really of the imagery in the video, you know, uh, the imagery in the video involved in, in all in these cases. And what's interesting is that um, as Mark Chicotti pointed out, and I was thinking along the same lines before I spoke to him, that this incident and the drone performance are very similar to mysterious drone incursions that occurred over Guam, of, of Guam and that were reported previously. Um, so that brings me to the end, if you guys have got any questions. Well, Frank, that was that was amazing, absolutely amazing. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, uh, did you you have brought. I had no idea that you would break it down to that level of granular detail. So let let me do this. Actually, uh, let me stop your screen share. Yeah. And yeah, I, so I, I think everyone owes Frank an enormous applause. Thanks, guys. <laughs>